All right, everybody, we're going to get started. Welcome to today's Hinckley Forum. My name is Max Lepore. The Hinckley Institute of Politics is a nonpartisan institute at the University of Utah. The Hinckley provides an array of transformative experiences for students through internships, forums, and classes. Hinckley forums seek to foster public discourse and civil debate on the most current and pressing issues, bringing in local, national, and international thought leaders. We want to thank you, Sara, Utah Support Advocates for Recovery Awareness for the partnership on this forum. Today's forum is titled Solutions to the Substance Use Crisis in Our State, and we are excited to be joined by some great panelists. Troy Bennett is a senior research analyst uh, at the Social Research Institute at the University of Utah. Megan West is a program administrator for the State Department of Health and Human Services Office of Substance Use and Mental Health. Jareth Williams is the ARCHES team lead at USARA. Kayla Jensen is the peer support team lead at USARA. And Jan Lovett is the family support facilitator at USARA. Today's panel is going to be moderated by Evan Doan, Associate Director of USARA. We're gonna start out with a video today, but please all wel please welcome me in welcoming our guest today. I believe that life should be hopeful. When I'm sitting with somebody who is struggling, I want to be that person that can be available just to even listen. And when you listen to somebody and they feel heard, I think they feel a little bit of hope. It's the best part of humanity, is to let somebody know who's struggling that um, there's hope and they aren't alone. USARA is an organization where the Utah Support Advocates for Recovery Awareness. Our mission is to connect and inspire communities to advocate for addiction recovery. And we really envision a Utah where recovery community and connection are seen as the most valuable assets for people to recover from addiction. In recent years, I think that there's been a shift in how we talk about addiction and uh, you know that there was a really powerful TED talk that came out a few years ago where this gentleman talks about how the opposite of addiction isn't sobriety, the opposite of addiction is connection. And I think that um, for those of us in recovery, that really resonated as being true. And so we want to make sure that people have an opportunity to experience that connection as part of their recovery. And so we provide a variety of different kinds of direct services, like we have uh, peer recovery coaching so people are able to meet with a peer recovery coach one-on-one -on -one and get some guidance to be able to sustain recovery over the long haul. I actually found out I was pregnant with my daughter when I was in jail and I stayed sober during my pregnancy. I went to treatment, I graduated. About a month after she was born, I used. I lost my job. My daughter was removed from my care and I got evicted. And so the only thing I knew how to do was continue to use. And then I decided that, you know, I didn't want to do that. I didn't want to watch my daughter call someone else mom. I actually got a recovery coach when I was pregnant with my daughter. My coach saw me through. There was support there. They showed up for me at my family team meetings. They showed up for me in different court hearings. And they were there to say, hey, you're not your past. I found that support to really be the parent I am today. My children were and are the jumpstart to my recovery. Peer support is an evidence-based practice found to be highly effective in helping people recover from addiction. Our family support program is also based on an evidence-based model uh, called the Community Reinforcement and Family Training Model. So it's CRAFT is the acronym. And um, it's been found to be highly effective in helping loved ones engage in a change process. I have a daughter who's now been in recovery nine and a half years. But when this journey started, I was trying to reach out for help. What can I do? So I went to this craft support group and I felt like I found a home. So I just started going to the group. And when I knew how important and how the skills that I was learning, how they worked, that to me was my profound moment, right? And when I found that out, it's I was talking to my daughter 
because I have a tendency to talk more than listen and lecture and nag and all of those things that we all know how to do really well. And I just listened to her. I listened the whole time. And, at the, and it was an hour. We we'd never had a phone call for an hour. I mean, it was five minutes before we were hanging up on each other. And at the end of that call, she told me, just, Mom, I think this is the best conversation we've ever had. And I get emotional every time I think about that because that is how profound learning these skills and learning how to communicate with our loved ones is. From there on out, I just kept going to group. And then next thing I knew, I was facilitating. Nine and a half years later, here I am. I'm still facilitating. My great joy when I'm supporting people on these family groups is people come and they're so broken. They don't know what to do. This is, for some people, this is their last hope, their last chance. They've tried everything else. You can almost see by the second or third meeting, things start feeling lighter for them. They start finding hope. The parents are finding joy in their lives again, which they haven't been able to do, right? Because we're so focused on our loved ones and how we can fix them. But in reality, who we have to fix is us. And once we start fixing us, we have more space to help our loved ones. We also have our ARCTIS program. It's our Addiction Recovery Coaching and Healthcare and Emergency Settings program. And um, in that program, we have peer recovery coaches that meet one-on-one -on -one with individuals in acute care environments after having experienced, uh, say, an overdose or any substance use related crisis. They're there to help connect that person to the next stage of their journey and their care. My recovery journey actually began in a hospital bed. I was so vulnerable and, and hurt and beat down and I just needed somebody to be able to show me the way to help give me some, some light. Now I'm able to help provide that and help see it. And it's just the second you walk into these hospital rooms and you explain to these people like, hey, I'm a person in recovery. I know what you're going through. Like you just see that, that light click in their head like, oh, this is someone I can trust. And then also we provide advocacy and public policy changes in the state of Utah. So we are the voice of lived experience up at the state legislature, telling elected officials um, what matters to us as people in recovery. I think of the naloxone bill, for example. In just the few years that we've had naloxone broadly available in the state of Utah, we're now at 9,000 reported overdose reversals. But that's at least 9,000 people that are alive today that wouldn't have been alive if we not passed that piece of legislation. And so for me, that's success. Putting people in a jail cell for their substance use doesn't work. And so how can we give them the opportunity to wellness opposed to punishing them for their illness? There's stigma there too, right? We often go, oh, that person's a criminal. You know, they're a bad person. And it's like, you know, in most cases, people make mistakes and they're greater than their mistakes. And I think that the recovery community does a really good job at loving people that have made mistakes. We've had many staff who've come from a participant in the program and then interested in becoming a peer coach take the peer support training. Um, and then after that training, we've got people interviewing for a job. The process is I've been given this and I want to give it to somebody else. What it means to me sharing my lived experience is that I really get to sit next to somebody and be in the moment with them and meet them where they're at. What we've been able to create in um, the way we do things at USERA is very much this inclusive culture. It's not exclusive. Recovery should be available for anyone. And I believe USARA has that ability to do that because we've all experienced that wanting to connect and wanting to have support to live differently. And we've created this environment where people can do that.
everybody. Um, as was mentioned, my name is Evan Doan. I'm the Associate Director at the Utah Support Advocates for Recovery Awareness. Um, thank you so, so much for being here today and watching our short film. Uh, we worked with the team at uh, Declarative to put this together and really does a great job in highlighting the work that we've been doing for many years to address the substance use crisis in our state. So we wanted to have a panel discussion here and talk with some of the people that were featured in the film um, about their experiences and their expertise as people with lived experience of recovery and family recovery and experts in the field, and um, really kind of um, give you an opportunity to also answer, ask some questions as an audience and engage with folks that are featured in the film. So I want to first off start off by talking a, bit, a little bit about how, you know, our, our services at USERRA were really tailored to fill gaps in systems, right? Uh, the systems of care that were, had existed for many years in our state that weren't really serving people or were, or were misserving people or weren't serving everyone properly. So I want to uh, ask a few of us if we can just kind of highlight, you know, how, um, you know, th first I want to thank you, Kayla and Jareth and Jan for sharing your lived experience in that video. I mean, it's just so powerful to hear those stories. Um, but I, I'm curious to hear how, you know, now that USERA has been in existence for a while now, how our, our services are changing the system, how things are improving. So any of the three of you want to chime in on that? Oh, it's already, oh, already connected. My bad. Um, so I think a major way that I have seen that we are impacting uh, the systems are is that we are able to go into different court systems, we go into different specialty courts, we are welcomed into staffings, and that is where I am able to use my lived experience and advocate for peers who have gone through similar things that I have and use a peer-based perspective and say, hey, maybe this could work, hey, this could have helped me, and I'm able to show up and do that, and I'm valued there now. Uh, so a way that I see it, so in these hospitals, we get to meet with people at their very, their most vulnerable that they are. They've come in there, they're already at their lowest, and we get to go in there and provide them with peer support, and we get to share our lived experience about like us being in that same place and provide them with hope and just a light that they can, that there is an end to this, that there is a possibility to recover and, and live, a, live a happy life. Um, we go into like the Volunteers of America and we meet with people who are homeless and we help connect them with resources for housing, treatment centers, and all sorts of ways just to help people move forward in their next step. So I come from a different perspective, right? I come from the families. And the gap that we've been able to fill is providing the family hope, right? So I went to Al-Anon, and that's what my EAP counselor told me to do. Al-Anon can help you more than I can. So I went to three Al-Anon meetings. It was not a fit for me, because what I didn't see was people getting better, right? Better can mean a lot of different things. There is no definition for better. I wish there was. I asked my daughter many times, what is better, right? So she's been in recovery for nine and a half years now, has two beautiful children, and is doing very well. I believe when I finally found Kraft, you know, Mary Jo, who you may have met earlier, uh, is the one that I spoke to that day when I was in crisis. What do I do, what do I do? And my daughter was in jail, I think for the third time that year, I lost track, it was a total of five in a year. Um, so when she said, hey, we have this support group tonight, it's a Kraft-based um, principal support group, if you, do you know what CRAFT is? Community reinforcement and family training. We use evidence-based principles. That's what really helped me, right? There was proof that if I used the skills that I was being taught in CRAFT, that that could help me and help my loved ones in turn. So when Mary Jo said, go to this group, I jumped on it, and I've been there since. So I started out as a family member, Darlene here, who runs our program, kind of reeled me in, and I've been facilitating classes now for nine and a half years. I think we're getting closer to 10. I helped Darlene train people across the country with these skills. And what is different between us and Al-Anon, and I'll try not to talk too much more, sorry, is that we actually provide skills. So, and tools that people can use in communicating with their loved one. Because what do we do best as family members? We nag, we plead, we threaten, because we think we can fix them, 
right? So what I learned, I gotta fix me. I have to work on me and my communication skills with my daughter. And that video that you saw when I talked about my daughter, that was such a profound moment for me and when I knew that these skills were going to help me through my journey in recovery and my family's. Thank you so much. And, and to highlight what you said, Jan, I think that so much of it comes down to hope, right? And, and so much of what USARA does as an organization in the community throughout all of our services is instills hope in individuals. Uh, Jareth, could you talk a little bit more about the ARCHES program and what you do in hospital emergency departments? So our ARCHES program, so we are a team, and so anybody who ends up in the hospital for overdose or any drug or alcohol related issue where they're trying to get on medicated assisted treatment. So the doctors and social workers call us to come in there and visit with these patients. And so when we're in there, we are just trying to find out what it is that they are looking for, what is their next steps, and help provide the resources to guide them along their way to what they're trying to get to. Thank you so much. And then uh, Kayla, I'm wondering too, if you could expand a little bit more upon what you do in long-term coaching to help people. Yeah, so we meet with individuals on a either a weekly or bi-weekly basis, and during that time we talk about you know different recovery-related goals. Say someone wants to get their driver's license, well, how do we get you there? What barriers are you facing? How can we help you overcome them? You know, different uh, situations with housing. Housing is a, you know can be a real barrier for people, so we work together to help find resources for that. We make connections. Say they want to get connected into sober softball, you know, we can help them find that avenue. Or they've tried a type of meeting and that wasn't really helpful for them. So there may be another type of meeting and kind of guiding them to those resources and support alongside them and not doing it for them. We also work on recovery capital and do utilize a, a different tools as well. Awesome. So speaking of recovery capital, I'm wondering, Troy, could you chime in a little bit about what recovery capital is? Maybe kind of explain that to our audience uh, yeah. as our researcher okay, and uh, why sure. it's important to recovery. Oh, absolutely. Um, recovery capital, you know, when you heard that term, sometimes you think about financial capital. And um, when you think about financial capital, you think about assets that people have or resources they have access to um, in times of need. You know, maybe there's a financial need or, or something comes up, you have an unexpected bill, and you have these finan this financial capital that you can draw upon. Uh, recovery capital is kind of similar in that it's assets and resources that people have access to, but it's not necessarily about money. It's about things like um, social connection, having a community that you feel connected to and people that you can talk to, um, stability in housing, having uh, housing that, that works for, for you and for your recovery. Um, as well as uh, kind of a belief in future and a hope in the future. And there's a few different uh, ways that it's being measured. Um, some of the uh, more common ones, one is called like the BARC, it's the Brief Assessment of Recovery Capital. And uh, another one is the, the SHUR, the Substance Use Recovery Evaluator. And uh, these are our tools that, um, they're surveys that people fill out and uh, self-report um, on these different domains of recovery capital and, and how they're doing. And um, it, uh, you know, this information I think can be helpful for organizations and, and coaches that are working with folks to identify where are some areas that we could build up some more capital in someone's life. I mean, maybe there's a need for some more social connection or, or housing um, is, is a, a big issue. And that sometimes translates into outcomes as well, where uh, one of the, the the outcomes that's measured in USARA programs are the number of people who have uh, stable housing. And you know, from intake to six month follow up, um, there's statistically significant increases in the number of people who report having stable housing. And um, that is, is one step um, forward in their journey. Awesome. Um, I'm gonna pick on you for just a minute more. Okay. And, uh, so I'm wondering, too, um, you know, you talked about outcomes a little bit there, and I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about how it's difficult to quantify outcomes in recovery and, 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 and how that's hard to get at and what we've been doing to try to kind of ascertain some of those outcomes. Oh, absolutely, yeah, the outcomes, I mean, are, it, it's tricky, and um, you know, across the board, you sorry, is a, a data-informed agency, they use, uh, evidence-based practices. They look at their own data to make decisions for programming. Um, some of the first projects that I became involved with were, uh, were called Building Communities of Recovery. And that started with looking at some of the data uh, 
some of the state data about where are some of the communities in Utah that had high rates of overdose, um, high rates of substance use, um, high rates of health disparities. And by identifying these communities, um, federal funding, uh, federal grants through SAMHSA were um, awarded to start uh, recovery community centers in like Price and in Ogden and St. George and Moab. And so kind of expanding out across the state. Um, some of the outcomes that we're tracking are things like employment status, um, stability in housing, and these kind of relate to recovery capital. But what we found when we are looking at some of the um, more common recovery capital measurement tools, like the BARC in particular, is it does a really good job of identifying people who have low recovery capital. Who, you know, there's an actual like, kind of cut point in the measurement scale that researchers have identified that if you're above the score of, of 47, it's, uh, you're more likely to be engaged in recovery a, a year later. And so if somebody comes in with a score that's lower than 47, you know, maybe there's um, you know, some heightened awareness on the part of the coaches or the people that they're working with. It's like, oh, you know, this person may need some help. And in some of those areas, they're typically uh, things like um, more concrete supports, you know, things like housing, things like having energy to get through the day, um, feelings of self-worth. And so those are some areas that you can kind of address first. Um, but what we've also found is that at higher levels of recovery capital, it's a little messier. It's hard to tell you know, how some people are more successful than others. And so there's definitely a need for more research in this area as uh, people progress uh, throughout their lives. So. Well, thank you so much, Troy, for your work at the Social Research Institute and our partnership with the University of Utah to do that work. It's been amazing. Um, you know, so I, I really appreciate our conversation about um, outcomes and how those are important and tracking those. I'm, I'm wondering too, can we um, maybe bring it back to some, um, what, what, how would you define a win with someone you're working with, Kayla, Jareth, or Jan? So a win for me is any step that's forward thinking, that's a progress towards their end goal, whether it's gaining, regaining custody or, you know, trial home placement or getting unsupervised visits, but it's that next step closer, or maybe they've made the decision to go abstinent, or they've made the decision to moderate or anything like that. It's, it's about what they want to do and how they're moving forward. So even if it's getting up and brushing their teeth and making it to their appointment that day, I celebrate that win because there may have been a time where they weren't able to do that. And so I really just celebrate all those small wins. And then as they, as we continue to meet and uh, talk about these wins, then we start celebrating bigger wins and bigger wins, and then it just you know can escalate. But even those small, you know, brushing your teeth, brushing your hair, which may seem normal and an everyday thing, sometimes it's too hard when you're in early recovery or you just got your child removed or you just got out of jail. There's all these different barriers, and so just celebrating anything because those are major wins. Awesome, thank you, Jareth. So I would say, uh, I think a win would be just them having us come into the hospital room. I mean, they're already broken down and the social worker or the doctor asked them if they're willing to meet with us. And just having that, them being willing to meet with us and have us come in as a win in general. And I mean, on top of that, just anytime we're in there and asking for any of these resources, whether it's needle exchange or whether it's mat and naloxone or anything like that, it's any of that is a win. And Janet, in the family support arena, when you're working with family members, how, how, what's a win for you? So the first win is actually getting them to come to the group. So the one thing that I talk about often is, and this is an area where I'd love to see some research as well, is I think in my nine and a half years of experience is almost as difficult for a family member to get help for them as it is for their loved one to walk through that rehab center or to ask for help. It's very difficult. So I'm with you, Jared. I think the win for me is first getting them there. That has to be step one. And I will say we get a lot of referrals from the ARCHES program because not only do they help the person who's in the hospital, they can refer the family members to one of our groups. Awesome. 
Um, Megan, so I'm so glad to have you here from the state of Utah to join us today. And you've been witness to, I think, you know, the e expansion of USARA services across the state. And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit from your perspective on seeing that expansion, seeing how things have changed, the landscape has changed. Um, just, you know, share, yeah, share your vision of, um, or your view of, uh, of USARA. My vision. <laughs> <laughs> so I've been with the state for five years and have managed the USARA contract for that time. So we get a huge chunk of federal funding that goes towards opioid um, recovery treatment, harm reduction services, everything all encompassing. So a couple of things, um, I had to write things down so I would remember. I think that as USARA has expanded across the state and now has five recovery community organizations, um, it's creating more access for people. People are learning what resources exist because you don't know there's craft if you don't know. So if you see a USARA sign, you might go home and Google it or you might hear about someone who's there. So having it spread in different areas is so important, especially rural areas that don't have the big treatment centers like the Wasatch Front does. So it's important to keep funding and keeping the program going because there's a lot of untouched areas still and a lot of people who don't have easy access. Um, oh no. I, I have a baby, so I can blame. The U.S. just very recently had a baby, so <laughs> she's got a good excuse. Yes. Oh. <laughs> The thought was, as it expands, as there's more awareness, stigma decreases. So people are more willing to talk about that they have a substance use disorder, that they have gone to treatment a few times, that they've entered into recovery, that they're in a different phase of recovery. So the more that we talk about it, the more normal it becomes, even though it is, people are more willing to get the help that they need, and then the help as it's needed can expand because there's more need so we can keep giving more access. Um, does that answer your question? It does, it's okay. awesome, yeah. So I, I really love that you bring up stigma and the impact that has on treatment and recovery. Um, I wonder too if some of our, um, our staff could talk a little bit about the impact of stigma on their work and how what we're doing to fight stigma. So let's start with Kayla again. Um, so with stigma, I think that I, well, I personally had faced a lot of stigma throughout my use, throughout my, even through my recovery journey. And so really being able to educate people on what my recovery journey looked like and help break that stigma for others, right? I get to go into these courtrooms and it may be, oh, this and this and this is happening. And I'm like, yeah, and, you know, look at look at this other perspective. And so really just educating through my own experience and through, you know, uh, like the video had mentioned, just because I have committed crimes, I've done all these things, I'm not my past. And so I really get to use myself and what I'm doing now to help end that stigma. And so in the, in the hospitals, I mean, we used to see a lot of stigma with the doctors, you know, they would come in and like, oh, it's another junkie or he's just here med seeking. And so we've seen a lot of change in where the doctors are actually shifting their care and actually doing a whole level of care for people who are in active addiction. And not only that, but now with the whole stigma change, we're actually able to help these people advocate for themselves to these doctors to be able so that they can receive the care that they are wanting and needing. Mm -hmm. Wow, stigma, this is a whole hour conversation in itself. So for families, I know for me, when my daughter was really struggling, I couldn't really tell anybody. I thought I was going to be judged, that I was going to be a bad mother. I thought people would think my daughter is a bad person. My daughter's not a bad person. She's an amazing human. So that's where I think stigma is for families. The other piece of stigma, and I hate this word, is enabling, right? You're enabling your loved one. You're allowing him to do that. That's not true, right? We can enable our loved ones to get better. Let's use it in a positive context instead of a negative one. 
Same with codependency. They're, you're codependent, meaning that, oh, you're dependent on their bad behavior so that you can function. That's not true either. So we have got to start looking at these things differently. And I cannot tell you how many parents, when we talk about enabling, we talk about it enabling in a positive way. And I can tell you now, so many parents are like, I'm so glad you said that. Because my family has told me to kick them out. My friends have told me to kick them out. That's not always the best answer, right? And detaching with love, for me, is not a thing, right? Because if we detach, and even with love, in my mind, I'm telling my loved one to go away and don't come back till you're better, right? That doesn't help anybody. Connection is what we need with our loved ones. Connection is what we talk about with our families. So for me, stigma is huge. It's huge in the language that we use, right? We call people addicts. That's not who they are. They're not an addict, right? And so when I love the term recovery and long-term recovery, right? Those are things that are so important. And for me, and again, these are my opinions, is that I don't think you're always an addict, right? We get better. Our family members get better. That doesn't mean that defines your entire life. So for me, that's what stigma is, right? It's defining a person and making them feel bad about who they are. And that's not how we can help get anybody better. Thank you, Jen. Very, very good points. Um, Kayla, I'm wondering too, could you talk a little bit more about your experience coming into services at USARA and what that was like for you personally? I know you talked a little bit on the film, but I'd um, love to hear about just your, your personal experience. Yeah, so I have been to many treatment centers. I've been incarcerated in both jail and prison. And by the time I walked through the doors at USARA, I was kind of at my last and I didn't really know where I was going. I had heard about them. And when I had walked in there, I was actually pregnant with my daughter and it was just so welcoming and it was, they were there to, regardless of what I was going through. They didn't judge me for the umpteenth treatment center I was at or why I was doing what I was doing. But it was like, hey, I understand. Let's work through this. And even like the little struggles of like being pregnant or like going through treatment, I had someone there that was really just supportive of me. And that really held through after I had my daughter, she was removed, and I had my recovery coach go to family team meetings with me and help advocate for me when I didn't know how to do that. I had been in this corner for so long with you know, feeling like everyone was against me, that I having someone there that was on my side was life-changing for me. And so now I'm able to do that. And it was such a welcoming place when I was uh, tapering off of um, uh, medication-assisted treatment. I sat in those, in that, I can't even talk, on the couches there and people just accepted me and it was just a safe place that I could go. And so I really use that in my services today and how I uh, help my participants is just, you know, showing up for them the same way that I had a recovery coach show up for me. I can help, you know, walk through how they can advocate for themselves in their family team meetings or in court or wherever they're, they're trying to advocate for themselves. But I really think that having the experience of being a participant and what that looks like and how meaningful it was for me and how life-changing it was is something that I really can take into my job. Thank you so much. Um, Megan, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about how what USARA does is different from what uh, other kinds of treatment and uh, re recovery organizations do in the state. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> You're giving me these big ones. <laughs> I am. <laughs> it's... I think USARA is very accessible and it's inviting and there's not a regimen. You can come at any time. You can stay as long as you want. You can come back. You can go. There's no, there's not like a script that you have to stick to. And that's so important in recovery because it's going to look different for everybody and everybody needs different things. So. It's a way to offer that. And then once you go, they help you get what you need. So having a peer support, having someone who's your teammate makes all the difference in anything, I think, especially recovery. And someone who believes in you and someone you can call. And that's there for you. No questions, which I think is huge. Um, you, Sarah, also hosts community events. So it's been recovery month all of September. And 
in the five years that I've done this, the expansion of community events is huge. At least double. Yeah. And then the teammates go to everything. So Mary Jo is the director, and she's personally going to all of these events. She's not at home. She's not in the office. She's there. The team is there. They're meeting people. They're hugging people. They're, they're in person. That makes a big difference. And so I, I had a meeting in Tooele last week, and they're having their, they had their recovery event Saturday. And this clinic that I was at didn't know that much about recovery day, but they were going to go to go. And I bet next year they have a booth. And then, you know, it expands. Each year gets a little bit more. Everyone gets a little bit more invested. So USER is giving that opportunity for the investment, I think. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I really like that you mentioned the Recovery Month activities because, of course, that's why we're here today, right? Yep. It's September is National Recovery Month. Um, and so that was a month that was established by SAMHSA in 1989. So it goes back 30 some odd years. And Utah has been celebrating Recovery Month for at least 20 years now. And uh, this year, for the first year, we had 13 events across the state of Utah during Recovery Month. So from Salt Lake to Provo to Manti to Kanab, right? Like there were events so people could see recovery where they live. Mm -hmm. um, so people could access recovery in their communities and see what resources are available to them there. And it's a part of life. Yeah, exactly, right? And life goes on, right? Mm -hmm. We, you know, we rec recover and people develop and change and go on to do great things. Yeah. And so, yeah, truly amazing. And the other thing I really like that you mentioned is the peer support perspective, right? Because I think that's truly unique to what we do is that, that peer that peer lens. Um, Jareth, I'm wondering if you could maybe address that a little bit, just you know, how you see your role as a peer. So I see my role as a peer is really just, just being myself, being able to meet with somebody who is going through a difficult time in their life and me just being able to be there to walk beside them, whatever it looks like for them, I'm just able to be there beside them, walking them through whatever turmoil they're going through. It's powerful. So as a state that was so significantly impacted by the opioid epidemic and continues to struggle with such high overdose death rates from substance use, um, just this is a question for everybody, but how is recovery support services, community engagement, and these kind of cross sector par partnerships that we've established uh, really made an impact? What, what changes have we made? What changes have we made? Um, I think we've made so many, it's hard to list. And just, and again, this is from my perspective and parents' perspectives and brothers and sisters, aunts and uncles and friends, right? Is that we all want to love our loved one. And one of our facilitators, um, one of the things she said one time accepting the award, and you may remember this, she said, craft allowed me to love my son again. That's a huge change, right? Because we're told, I talked about detached with love before. Um, so many people think that, oh wow, we're not really supposed to love our family member. Right? A lot of people feel like that. There's that, all that shame. So I think that's a really big step. I also think it's allowed people to have space to talk about it, which is really important. I don't know how many of you have had a conversation with a friend, and they're like, oh yeah, we're going through something like that too, or I've had a problem. So that's what I think you, Sarah, has such a big impact on. And just having the peer um, coaches is amazing. And when you can give comfort to somebody, whether it's someone who's suffering with a substance use disorder, or mental health um, issue, or a family member, it makes you feel good inside that someone is finding some peace and joy, even if it's just for a few minutes, right? So to me, that's where a lot of the, um, the impact is that we've, we've done, plus access to different meetings all across the state. When I started, we had one office, right? Everything was in person until COVID. Now we can actually use, we use Zoom meetings every week. We have three or four online meetings every week that people across Utah can join. So that's pretty awesome. We didn't have that before. Rural communities are tough. They're really tough because they're small. And again, they're stigma. So I think with Price was such a crucial place for us to open up in. 
um, and just trying to reduce the stigma and get the police officers, right, the sheriff to buy into what we're doing has been awesome. So I love that part. Oh, should we just go down? Sure. sure. So I believe it was 2014, Utah was fourth in the nation for overdose death, opioid overdose death. And we're not anymore, I think we're in the 40s somewhere. So less people are dying, more people are living. That's huge. Um, I think a part of that is the things that I've already said. There's access. We're decreasing barriers. We're decreasing stigma. It's OK to ask for help. It's OK to get a different kind of treatment. Not everyone needs to go in for 60 days say that that person uses again, maybe they're kicked out. What does that do for someone? Nothing. So changing the way things are done has happened, and it's happening. It's not perfect. We have a long way to go, but it's, it's beginning. And having this type of community organization is imperative in that change and as part of that system. I know. Um, when I when I think about change, um, you know, I, I, I think about the data, and and one of the things that we've been measuring is with the craft program um, over the years are uh, people's level of knowledge, skills, and confidence that they can make their family better, that they can improve the well-being of themselves as well as of their struggling loved one, and um, through. Uh, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pre and post test surveys, we've seen um, increases in people's um, levels of knowledge, knowing what to do to help their family. Um, skills, learning the skills, like I have the skills to um, you know, help my family improve. And then also be, having the confidence, um, being confident that they can implement these changes in their lives, I think is very important. So I believe uh, a big change is uh, the access to healthcare that there is available now, the access to treatment that is out there. Um, so my team, like we're 24-7, 365, and we are being able to help with two different MAC clinics that are available, and um, we're starting studies. We're in the Volunteers of America, and I just believe that just these little steps that we're making is gonna be a ripple that's gonna affect us in the long run and help us get to the bigger change that we need in Utah. So um, I think that having access to different, like Narcan and Naloxone and harm reduction tools and educating, like you mentioned, the uh, different clinics and just having more access to those and letting people know that they're not alone. We have different phone or phone lines that you can call, you know, to not use alone. We have different uh, organizations that are going out onto the streets and doing a needle sur or syringe exchange and offering these you know, on the spot services. And I think that making it so that the individuals know that they're human and they're treated as they're human, I think is a huge thing as well. Cause then they're, want, they're able to go seek out medical attention or they want to because they know that they're not gonna be treated just like an, another person, another number that they may be seen for who they are and what they're going through. Awesome. Well, um, I wanted to provide some time for the audience to ask some questions, if, if you have any. Um, I do have my own question first, just quickly, if we could quickly have someone define what MAT means. I know that we've mentioned oh. a few times. So uh, It's medication-assisted treatment. Also, yeah. MOUD is medication for opioid use disorder, or MAUD, which is medication for alcohol use disorder. Very good. Yeah. Cool. Questions? Anybody? What kind of policy? We're going to oh, okay. <laughs> Um, what, what kind of policies have you, Sara, advocated for to be changed at the legislative level, and how have those policies helped impact the work and um, recovery? That's a great question. And um, so I'll actually handle a little bit of that, because I know quite a bit about that. Doing, as the associate director, I do a lot of our advocacy and public policy work. Um, so we've, we've, we've touched many levels of the system of care, right, to help improve outcomes for people in recovery from substance use disorders. That ranges from having access to harm reduction resources like naloxone. Um, so prior to a few years ago, you could not get naloxone outside of a hospital environment. Now anyone in the state can carry that medication and it, all it does is reverse an opioid overdose and it saves lives every day. 
Um, so you know, that's, that's a huge little change that we made in public policy that made a big impact on the world. We've also worked on uh, criminal record expungement, allowing more people to access uh, 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 expungement for their records if they have a uh, criminal record so that they can go on to you know, get things like housing and employment because those, a criminal record could be a barrier to those things. So we've really been trying to impact you know, those where we see stigma intercept um, public policy. Um, other chime-ins on that? Well, so we're all encouraged to make our trip to the Hill and advocate during the legislative session. Um, both my daughter and I have been up at the Capitol and advocated, and the lock zone was huge for me. I wanted to get my hands on it. And um, there was even stigma with that for a long time. My doctor wouldn't even give me it, because at first she had to have a prescription. So my doctor wouldn't even give me a prescription for it. She says, well, your daughter needs to come in. I'm like, what? She can't give it to herself, number one. So it's advocating on the Hill in our policies, which is super important. It's also advocating in our doctor's offices, right? So I think that's really crucial. Any chance I get, I'm also advocating to my healthcare providers, which I think is huge, right? Because we've got to change their minds too. So, and even in, in the social work environment, right? Um, you talked, Jareth, about doctors changing. Well, I'll tell you now, social workers are changing because social workers were burnt out and they were tired. And I think through all of the work we've done and that, you know, especially Evan and Mary Jo and other team members have done, have made a lot of this possible policy-wise, right? We talk to legislators. And when you talk to legislators, you put a face on something that needs to be changed. So advocating is huge for us. I think beyond just the actual policy changes, there's the connection and the network that's created so that if there is something recovery or substance use or treatment related, the legislators and lawmakers and their teams know who to call. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's a really important component in making the policy changes. Another major shift that we've made, I think, in public policy is um, we were really instrumental in Medicaid expansion in the state of Utah. So prior to a few years ago, um, you could not get Medicaid unless you were met some very specific qualifications. And um, as part of the work that we've done, we've expanded access to Medicaid services. And so I, I know that in my experience at the organization, I started out as a volunteer in 2015. And when I was first volunteering and answering the phone, the number one question we get on the phone was, how do I get my loved one into treatment? And we don't get that question nearly as often anymore because people now have the resources they need to get someone into treatment. And that's a game changer. Just getting able to get people the treatment they need to access recovery is a game changer. Yes, I want to say. Um, as community members, you know, in addition to, you know, advocacy, what else can we do to support organizations like USAR? Definitely. So I think that we all have a role to play in reducing stigma in our state, right? So let's start with that. Um, and of course, um, we are a nonprofit organization as well, right? And so we rely upon the financial support of the community. And so we are generously given support by our friends at the state of Utah and some federal partners as well. But um, we also need, you know, individual donations and private private funding as well. So um, other comments on that? The one thing I wanted to mention is that all of our services are free. I don't know if we've talked about that yet, but that's super important. We provide the materials for our family support members, right? We give them a book and a workbook. So that's huge. And I think, you know, as community members, what you can do is encourage someone you know who might be suffering whether it's a parent, a family friend, or someone who actually has a substance use disorder. Um, encourage them to get help and you know, let them know about you, Sarah. There are other options to AA and Al-Anon, and that's the one thing I do love about you, Sarah. We support all pathways to recovery, no matter what that looks like, right? So I think that's really important, and just letting people know that when they come see us, we're not going to shame them for drug use or alcohol misuse or any of that. That's not what we're about. We're about meeting people where they're at. And so just referrals are huge and supporting your friends are huge, but 
ditto what Evan said. We are a nonprofit, and we do provide our services for free. Um, well, expanding on that, those other groups physically meet in the office space. So AA groups and NA groups, and they're welcomed to take some of that time and space. Yeah, so I think what you're getting at is that our community centers, we have many different kinds of mutual aid groups that meet there. So yep. some of them might be 12-step like AA, but some of them could be smart recovery or recovery dharma. We've even had like fitness and yoga-based groups and other kinds of recovery support groups that started out at Fusara. Yeah, definitely. Oh, yeah, question. Um, you mentioned that there are different pathways. I think some people like know like Al-Anon and Alcoholics Anonymous and all of that. But um, I wonder both as like a young person in recovery, um, here at the U we have a recovery community, um, Recovery at the U and it's fantastic. And I kind of wonder uh, if you've seen a rise in young people um, in your recovery programs and how that might be shifting what the perception of recovery can look like. So I'll, I'll start with that one. I, so I, um, uh, I've been around at the organization for some, some time now, and so I actually got to witness the creation of the Recovery at the U program, which is amazing, which was done by some local members of Young People in Recovery, a chap the, the chapter of Salt Lake, that actually meets out of our USARA Recovery Community Center. So um, there's been a huge shift in more people getting involved in recovery and um, helping their friends to access recovery and provide safe spaces on places like campus um, to have you know, a supportive environment, which is... Uh, it, and it's a game changer up here where um, some people could feel like they didn't have that kind of support before. Now they can, they can access those supports, you know, where they're going to school. So one thing I would, and I'm going to have a, a brain fart here too. Um, the one thing that helps younger people, older people get into recovery is their family members, right? Learning to communicate differently. We are so lucky we have so many people in recovery and they will come up and tell us how great it is that their loved one found a family support group. And you know, a lot of young people will say, you guys, you need to go get help for yourselves. That happens all of the time. And so I think that's how we help advocate for younger people, right? Because substance use disorder, mental health, age does not discriminate, right? It's just Everyone is susceptible. So it's great when we can learn skills to help our loved ones, encourage them to get the support that they need without shame. And I think that's really a huge thing, especially with younger people, right? Yeah. Um, I was talking to Tiffany, one of your colleagues earlier, about the importance of person-first language in this space. I was wondering if you could cover some of the important language or language shifts that as we're talking about this issue, we could be using. Yeah, super important. Yeah, it's a great way of reducing stigma. It's just changing the language that we use. Kayla, I, I know that you've become something of an expert on this. Do you want to share? Yeah, so one of the commonly used terminologies right now is relapse or lapse. And what we, what I prefer to use is incident of use. And the reason for that is that, because when I hear the word relapse, it's just like this negative connotation and it sounds so dark and nasty. And there were times in my life where it was an incidence of use. I had used and I, the next day or the next week, I was able to, you know, kind of get back onto the road that I was on previously. Um, so that's one that I like to use. Uh, also the word denial, right? We hear that a lot. Oh, they're in denial. One that I like to use is ambivalence. Maybe they aren't just to the point of, you know, admitting or coming to terms, whatever you want to say with their substance use disorder or anything like that. That um, one that's huge is homeless, you know, uh, they're homeless, they're on the streets. One that I like to use is that they're unsheltered, uh, and it because it could be temporary, right? It may not be necessarily due to their choices, it could be temporary, or it could be their choice. And so using the word unsheltered is something that we like to use. Um, one, uh, committed suicide is one that comes up and as a commonly used term. And what we, what I uh, like to use is died by suicide. Um, and the reason for that is, again, that negative connotation and 
you know, you're still addressing that they passed away and then, you know, by their cause, it's not just directly by that. Um, and when talking about an individual who suffers with a mental health condition, instead of saying, you know, like, oh, that person's bipolar, that individual lives with bipolar or they are living with bipolar or they are suffering with bipolar. And then you're taking the diagnosis out of the person, right? Because they're still the person first. And so they're able, it's able to shift between those two. Awesome. We might, okay, we probably have time for one more question. It's fast. Um, <laughs> uh, I like microphones. Um, do you guys have any street outreach services? And if you do, what does that kind of look like when it comes to like the path to recovery? Totally. Jareth, do you want to talk a little bit about what we've done in that space? So, um, so for street outreach, so we have, Back when COVID started, we, we went out with uh, the state and with the Volunteers of America and did outreach to check on the unsheltered population, make sure that they had the items and stuff that they needed. Um, so we were going through, we would, you know, we had socks, we had water, we were bringing out to, to the unsheltered and just seeing if there was any other resources they would need and also being able to work with the VOA to help transfer them to the VOA if they were needing a place to stay and get some food and and clothing and stuff, so. Thank you so much. Well, thank you again so much, everyone, for being here today. Um, it's really our honor to present our work to you, and um, thanks for being involved. Yeah, can we give our guests one more round of applause, please? <laughs> awesome, thank you, guys.